Thank you. We might give the orchestra a clap. What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, this, we're going to start with this piece. This is contemporary orchestration, right? And in the curriculum, what do they call it when they have players doing all sorts of weird things like, they call it playing on the bridge or whatever. What do they refer to that in the syllabus or the curriculum, do you know? When you're writing outside the norm. In the syllabus, is called extended techniques. Do you have that term down here? Yes, extended. Do they have that term, Jenny, extended techniques? There are some, it's a crazy term because every composer extends the technique somewhere along the line. And I'm going to give you an example. Cellos, will you just play a G, your open G, please? Now, for years, cellos just did that. So... <laughs> They did, right? So, and friends in the opera, like if I asked her to play a G, would you play a G, please, Swellen? Va bene stasera, la luna, no, down to a C. Down to a C. Va bella giorno, back to the G. Va G. And people thought, wow, that's cool. And then, Monteverdi came along and said, I'm over that. I'm going to ask you to do this, cellos. Da 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 Here we go, cellos on the Gs, and three and four, and duck it, 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 duck it. And what did the cellos do? What do you reckon? They went on strike. They did, they went on strike. Truly. It was in Combatimento. And the violins were playing, ya da 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 We just do a G major scale like that, violins, and one and two, and ya ba 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 da 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 And the seconds went, ya da 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 And the first went up, so we have a contrary motion, and we have da 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 three and four, and da 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 here we go, violas, and three, and four, and da 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 And the cellos led the strike. They walked, they were not strike. And Monteverdi, that's when Monteverdi wrote the famous document, little page. And he said, we have three things in music, we have now discovered a third. The first was that which is pensive, that is music which we think about that doesn't really deal with an emotion. The next is pastoral, which deals with outdoor things and life that is extraneous. But we don't have a music which is intensely emotional. And he wrote this piece called The Combatimento of Tancredi and Clorinda, which deals with a Christian fighting a Muslim. But they don't know that one is a girl and one is a boy. And they meet at a well. And they look at each other. They have their masks off. She's a Muslim and he's a Christian. They look at each other and what happens when they meet at the well? What do you reckon, Abe? <laughs> they fall in love, as you do, okay? <laughs> Go into the well. So they then, they fall in love and they, they depart. They put their mask back on 
and they ride in a different way. So if, to do that, Monteverdi did this. Can we just have G's again? So just open G's. Everyone playing an open G. And we're going to go one, two, three. One, two, and D, da, 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 da. So Monteverdi did that. He called that the motto di cavallo, the movement of the horse, and the players were beside themselves. They'd never done anything which had tempo changes and metre changes. And then when they got to this, the principal cello said, we, we can't play anymore. And Monteverdi said, fine, I will find someone who can. <laughs> Guess what? They all turned up. They all turned up. And the piece lasted for 17 minutes. And it changed the course of operatic thinking, that piece, that one 17-minute piece. And it's reported that at the end, audience was on the floor weeping at the incredible intensity of the singers. Because what happens is, Monteverdi, uh, uh, Clorinda and Tancredi fight, but they don't know who the other is. They just know their warriors fighting. And he kills her and takes off the mask and realises it's the person he loves. Not a happy ending, guys. <laughs> Not happy. That was a really important thing because there was a rule about operas later that they all had to be happy. In the 18th century, you couldn't go into a German opera house with a sad opera. So Monteverdi wrote that. Then he wrote another piece about horrible people called Papaya, in which not one character is good. They're all vile, evil people, except Seneca. Now, the reason I'm saying that is he changed musical thought. He changed musical thought, how people thought about music. And composers are still trying to find ways of how do we change things? What do we do? So let's see how this composer starts. So I'm not going to, the person who's playing knows what happens. See if you can tell me what's happening. Just start when you're ready, the person who plays the very first bar. So where's that sound coming from? What instrument is that? That's a tam tam. What's your name? Tony. Tony. Thank you, Tony. Now, what's interesting about it, Tony? <coughs> He's playing? Exactly. It's normally played with a large mallet, but how's it being played now? With brushes. With brushes. Can we hear it again, please, Gary? So, is that an interesting use of the tam tam? What do you reckon? What do you think? What's your name? Jack, what do you think, Jack? Um, I'm not sure. You know what, Jack? I share your opinion. I'm not <laughs> sure either, OK? What do you think the composer is trying to do? The piece is called Grey Clouds and it's based on a list piano piece. So what do you think the composer is trying to do with the, the shaking of the tam-tam bear? We can't really answer that question because we really don't know. We can imagine all sorts of things, OK? So let's see what happens next. Let's go to bar two, and we'll have the instruments that play in bar two, but not strings, the other instruments. And one. So what are the instruments there? Ben? Tuba and harp. Now, what have you noticed about the tuba? Guys, what do you notice about the tuba? The boy sitting next to Abe. I'm not sure. Pardon? I'm not sure. Do you know where the tuba is? Tim, just stand up so we can all identify you. There is the tuba. It's muted. It's muted. Thank you very much. Tim, can we hear that without the mute, please? And then we might have, why would the composer bother to mute? So let's have a listen. And... Now let's put that together with the harp. So I can hear the harp and the tuba and unmuted, unmuted, harp and tuba unmuted and one. Now 
Now let's hear it muted and see if the mute makes any difference. Which it clearly does, but we want to know what's the difference. And one. So what's the difference, guys? What do you reckon? What's your name? You. You. <laughs> you. What's your name? Pardon? Liam. Liam. What's the difference, Liam? It's a lot softer. It's that softer. And what does it do for the harp? Oh, it makes the harp stand out better than Yeah, it makes the harp stand out. And it's a really good idea. It's actually a good idea. I wonder where this, the arranger might have got the idea from. I'm going to hazard a guess and say Prokofiev. And I'm going to say that when you want to know about arranging and odd doublings, Prokofiev is the master. He's the master. Tuba and violin solo or tuba and pick solo, all that sort of thing. In Romeo and Juliet particularly, any of the suites. Wonderful, wonderful effects in Prokofiev. Still doing those standard things. So it's a very interesting double. Let's hear what the strings do in bars two, three, four and five. Here we go. And one... So, what are, what are those sounds? Who are the string players? Hands up if you're a string player. <laughs> Who are the string, are string... Ben, you're a string player. So, I'm picking on you because I know you from Sunday's rehearsal. So, um, what are the strings doing? Uh, artificial, harmonics. artificial harmonics. Explain an artificial harmonic. Ben, stand up. <laughs> and tell us what an artificial harmonic is. Put your fourth finger down. Whatever, if you're a cello. Um, you can move the, the resonance points. And that's the artificial harmonic is a really interesting effect. In fact, they can, that was a very good explanation, Ben. Thank you. OK. Now, strings, let's find an artificial harmonic. Just any, any, find any artificial harmonic, OK? And just move free, freely around your instrument. The, this, for this effect, a lot of... There we go. Now, <clears throat> there's an Australian composer who uses that device almost exclusively with strings, almost exclusively, and his name is Brian Howard. And practically every piece he writes has artificial harmonics for strings, and the players go insane <laughs> because he writes... <laughs> and it's all artificial, it all moves, and they go insane. But when it's together, it's amazing. Let's see what happens over here on this side, in bar six. Is that right? Yeah, six. And. So that's just a jack? Um, I don't know. Who knows what you call that? <laughs> Tom? Abe? Abe's friend? <laughs> Perfect. Tremolo. It's a tremolo. It's a Monteverdi effect, okay? It's the Monteverdi effect a bit faster. What did the arranger actually write, though? We've made a modification. Could you play what the arranger actually wrote? What do you reckon? And here we go. And... That's... The arranger wrote octaves, and that makes it really clumsy. It makes it really quite clumsy, okay? But that, that effect brrr, alone is plenty of effect. Now, let's see what the wind do. Let's go to bar three, please, uh, four, wind players, including, bla, including the brass. So, bar four and one.
Thank you. So what do you hear there, guys? What do you hear the wind section doing? What do you actually hear going on there? Hmm? Who starts? We'll do it again. Here we go. Guys, I'm not going to give up. All right, so <laughs> you may as well just join in. Here we go. One more time. And bar uh, four. So the questions are who starts, and that's pretty obvious, and who joins in. Here we go. And one. So, who starts? The flutes, good. Then who comes in after the flutes? Yeah, oboes and clarinets, and then? The horns, and then who's the last to come in? The trumpets, okay. Now, what do you notice about what they play? Have we heard it before? Yes, who played it before? The flutes, yes, but who played it before the flutes? The tuba, that's right, and the harp. Now. This is an oral test. Here we go. Let's hear the first interval, please. Tim, your first interval. And what interval is that? Palm, palm. Mm, it's a? Music students. It's a perfect fourth. What's your name? Rhiannon. Rhiannon. Good. It's a perfect fourth. And let's hear the next one from the G to the C sharp. And what's that one? Rhiannon. It's, it's a fourth, but it's not perfect. What is it? Who knows? Ben? It's an augmented fourth. Okay. And with Liszt, that he was, people think Liszt was just a pianist. That's not true. He was a great harmonist. He did an enormous amount for harmony, an enormous amount. A lot of composers learned obliquely from what this did. And this, this arranger concentrates pretty much on all of this. So we'll play the first 10 to 12 bars, and then when I turn to you and I go like that, that's when you have to do serious listening because there are more questions. Jack, can you imagine? <laughs> yes, yeah, okay. Here we go, from the beginning. <clears throat> Guys, I know it's not cool to answer questions, but why do we go to school? Why do we go to school? There's only two reasons for going to school. Carmen? Learning. That's the first. And the second is? Not just learning, but learning what? Learning how to learn. And what's the second reason? Learning how to think. End. They have the two reasons we go to school. Is that clear? Good, what's your name? Carl. Carl, it's clear, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> when I ask you a question, what am I encouraging you to do? Answer. Answer and think. Think. Does it matter if it's wrong? No, who cares? Why? If it's wrong, who cares? And if it's wrong, we can learn something from it. Do you get that, guys? Okay? And I don't give in, do I, Jack? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm a real pest. Here we go. And from the beginning. And when I turn to you, that's where we need to be listening. Really listening, super listening. And.
Okay, so what'd you hear? What do you hear in that text, Rhiannon? Sorry? A lot of odd harmony. Does it sound like a piano piece? No. So this arranger has gone right over the top. Sometimes it just doesn't sound like the list at all, and that's okay, because the assignment was take that as an idea, but see what you can do. So what do you know? Let's listen to the figure. Can we go to 10, please, everybody? Wind and brass and percussion at 10. Listen here, and listen to the trombones. The question is, what are the trombones doing? Here we go. 10, and... Jack, what are the trombones doing? Hmm? What are the trombones doing? Can you hear what they're doing? Um, yeah, but I can't really describe it. Okay, what, can you sing it? No. Are they going, ah, do you recognise that? Yeah, so how would you describe that? Liam? Glissing. Glissing, exactly. What's the word, what's the full word for gliss? Glissando, Glissando meaning a slide. That's right, they're sliding. So, so Jack, what's the word? Glissing or glissando. So now you can describe it. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Good. So what are they doing? They are? Glissando. Thank you. Okay, well done. So what else is happening there? What percussion instrument is used? There's a percussion instrument that's relatively rare, relatively. Let's hear it. At um, bar 14. The percussion at bar 14. Listen, guys. And what's that? Carl? What does, does, does the sound, do you recall anything in the sound? Let's hear it again. Thanks, Gary. And a whip. That's exactly what it is. It's a whip. Okay? And let's have everybody in bar 14. So let's see what happens in bar 14 orchestra. Everyone. Here we go. 14. And. So what happens? Liam? Right, and how does, he, how does she, this is a female arranger, how does she get that? What does she do? What does she ask the brass to do? Yeah, staccato, exactly. Very, very short. Listen to the brass chords there at uh, bar 14, guys. And. Bang. That's a really good idea. And you can use that in your arrangement. So what's actually good about it is if you're very brave, you can get them to repeat those sorts of things. It's a great effect. Listen if they, like guys, can we do that as, say, four beats in the bass? Go, ba, 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 ba. Here we go. And, ah. That's a really interesting idea, okay? It's an idea that comes from the early 20th century from the Russian school. Stravinsky, people like that, use those sorts of ideas. So there's a wealth of stuff you can copy and if you copy from good people, you're going to write a really good piece. So let's go on. Let's see what happens after 14. So bar 14, here we go. And I want you to listen to the violas. Do you know where the violas are? Violas, can you stand up? There they are. Okay. The, the, the answer is, what, the question is, what are they doing? Here we go. So 14 and... So what are the violas doing? Let's hear it, violas, just alone. Do you mind, violas? Three, four. Carl, what do you reckon? How would you describe that? Um, like the sound crescendo. crescendo. Yeah, and what about the rhythm? Tremolo. Is it like a tremolo? Yeah. Dugga, 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 dugga. Do a tremolo, guys. And. But now they actually go. Duck it, duck it, duck it. So what does it have? It has not tremolo barn. What do you call that? 
Da 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 da. Have we heard that pattern before in the piece? Da 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 da. What's the rhythmic groove? If it's in four four, what are they playing? And da ka 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 da ka. Abe, what are they playing? Abe's free. Semi quavers. Who says semi quavers? What's your name? Abigail, semi quavers, that's correct, Abigail. They're playing semi quavers. Well done. Let's hear it again, violas. Three and four and. Now, the question is does it make a difference to the arrangement? Does that little figure in the violas, does that really add anything? Let's play everyone at 14. Here we go. Because as an arranger, you need to make decisions like this. Here we go. 14 and. What do you think? Do you think it's a big, powerful effect, Jack? Mm -hmm. You do? Good. Who has another view about it? Tom, what do you think? Do you have a view about it? You. Um, yeah, it's sort of subtle, but it's definitely there. It's definitely there, isn't it? Yeah. It actually has its life earlier. It starts earlier with the, the, where the violas go right at figure 10, but that's where we really, really hear it. Now, there's something there which I think is not working in this arrangement, and I'm going to point that out, and I would do it to the arranger if she were here. Let's hear the harp at 18. Listen. Now, the harp has got this written against it. Biz big, B-I-S. B I G. And biz big is an abbreviation for bisbigliato, meaning whispering. Let's hear it again, please, Roman. So let's play everybody at 16 and let's see if we actually hear the harp whispering. Here we are at 16. And. So, did you hear the harp, guys? No, and probably the harp didn't either. So, we, we have to ask the question, why does the arranger do that? What's the point of that? And this is where, when we're looking at arrangements, we say, actually, that little bit there for the harp, there's really no point, we would tacit the harp there. We just wouldn't have the harp play, because there is no point. Unless you completely rearrange the music and you take the brass out, and you bring in the brass a bar later. So let's go from 16, and brass don't come in until 17. In other words, play your bar 18 at 17. You know what I mean? Like a bar later. Your bar 18 at 19. Here we go. So this is 16. So we're going to do the bisbigliato. Here we go. And. Now we can hear the harp. Yes? So the, the, the arranger has the effect. Now, as we go on, this part of the music, can we go from 20, please, everybody? Right on 20. And. <laughs> Good. OK. Now, so what do, you, what do you hear there? Abigail? Lots of chromatic notes, okay? All falling down. All the patterns are different. So let's hear, let's hear the first pattern. Here we go. At 20. And. Okay, and they're playing mixtures of sixes and fours and sevens, all that sort of thing, okay? Let's hear the second violins at 20. And one. And that's sort of like the first, isn't it? So put them together and listen to what happens. First and seconds together, and.
Now, the question is, do they have to play every note accurately? What do you reckon? <laughs> That's a loaded question. That's called a loaded question. Now, if we were going to play every note accurately, we would rehearse this for about 25 minutes. And then we'd all go on to intravenous Valium. So, <laughs> because it wouldn't have changed a great deal. These are effects, okay? These are really special effects. But there's a crazy effect. And it's in the cellos. Would you play what's written in cellos? Here we go. 20 strings at 20. Here we go. And... So we hear the cellos going dun 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 the pizzicato, but if we change that to arco, that's different. And the most amazing effect is the viola. This is the best part of the arrangement for this part is the way the viola starts. True. Here we go. It's the best part of the arrangement. The violas. And now cellos are going to go arco and that's a different sound, isn't it? Very strong. Okay, good. Now, let's go on at bar 22. Here we go. Now, there's an instrument that comes in the wind section that we haven't heard clearly yet at bar 22. Here we go. Look over into the wind section. What's the instrument we hear that we haven't heard yet? <coughs> Anyone hear it? Did you hear it, Rhiannon? Have we heard the oboe? Here yeah, we have. This is a, a, a solo. We'll do it again, guys. It's up in, up in the wind section. One more time. 22. You just got to listen. It's, I know it's dense in the texture, but you can hear it. And 22. And boom. <laughs> The bass clarinet. Well done. Can we have that solo, please, David? And that's a really interesting idea. This arranger has lots of really interesting ideas. They don't necessarily have very much to do with list, but that doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter because it's quite free. Let's go on. Let's pick it up, please, ladies and gentlemen, at figure 30, uh, 34, bar 34. Now. This is where all the effects almost come together. Here we go. 34. And. Thank you. Now, let's ask the stream players a question. How do you feel, ladies and gentlemen, in the string session about playing a lot of this full ponticello tremolo? Do you have views about it? Stephanie, do you have a view about doing endless full ponticello tremolo? Endless? Yeah. <laughs> Which it almost is. The thing is, guys, after a while, if you're writing effects, which this arrangement is, they stop being interesting. Once I listen, Twice, I'm interested. Three times, I'm fascinated. Four times, I'm ready for dinner. So you've got to be very careful about how you use effect in arrangement. You, she gets away with this. She has it over four bars. And what, why it works is the accents. Listen to how they do it. And this is something you can learn about orchestration. And it's Mark Sul Ponticello. So they play it very close. Play it without uh, non, uh, play it normal. Not so part of Joe, please, ladies and gentlemen. And. Thank you. And now, so Ponticello. Thank you. And. Yeah. 
and that's why it works. Just towards the end of that crescendo justifies the existence of all of that Ponticello. Now, the great Ponticello writer, again, I'm going to re refer to is Prokofiev. Get your teachers to play you the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. And the, the Ponticello and that is amazing. Some really great stuff you can learn from Prokofiev. And it's still tonal effect. It's still tonal music, music that's still in major minor keys. Now, let's, hit, let's go on at 38. Here we go. 38. Everyone. And... Now, thank you. The harp. Let's, would you mind doing that little passage? Um, Bronwyn, in the harp, he's giving G flat, D natural, E flat. Is that all helpful? It is. Do you mean at 43? Yes, at 43. It tells me what pedal configuration to use. So in the harp part, if you're not sure about harp writing, speak to a harpist because what harpists tend to do is rewrite all their parts. It doesn't matter who wrote it. The people they don't rewrite are Debussy, Ravel and Puccini. Richard Strauss they have to rewrite entirely. He didn't have a clue. And it's true, he didn't. And they, you have to rewrite every harp part of Strauss. And the harpists go insane, rewriting parts. And the harp is a really interesting instrument because the harp is at home in C flat major. That's the harp's natural territory. I think that's right, isn't it, Bronwyn? C flat, we're happy in C flat. So, and that's the pedals will keep changing that. Now, that's not life-changing information, but it's good trivia. So, <laughs> anyone ever ask you about the harp? So, let's listen to what the harp does, just at that point, at 43. Now, there are three things the harp does that are interesting. One is the glissando. That's, that's happy harp. Glissando, happy harp. This one, not happy harp. And then even less happy, boom, harp monic up there, up to go in that forever. And so the harp now hates the arranger. And <laughs> that's all good. But it's, it's perfectly playable. It's perfectly playable. And it's, it's not a bad effect. What is What's interesting about effect is the use of the triangle. Did you hear the triangle in that passage? I guarantee no one did, okay? And this is something arrangers do a lot. When in doubt, add a percussion instrument. Wrong. <laughs> when in doubt, leave it out. Not just percussion, but about the instrument. And each one of these instruments, when you're arranging, has wonderful facility. And which do you think is the most useful instrument in the orchestra? And there is one, the most useful, a really, really, really useful instrument. It's the French horn because the four of them have an extraordinary range and the French horn will go with anything. If you want to double an instrument, you've got a piccolo, French horn will do it. Double bass, French horn will do it. The French horn is like orchestral glue. They will hold everything together. The horn textures are, I'm not trying to make the horns feel happy, it's true. <laughs> and the composer who thought about that most was Brahms. Brahms wrote some really interesting stuff for horn, solo violin and flute in octaves. Really interesting how composers experiment with this sort of thing. So let's hear from the last time, 38 to the end. Thank you. Now listen to the triangle.
What's the instrument that dominates the sound? There is one that dominates the sound. What do you reckon, Carl? Um, strings. Does it, okay, let's just play the last chord, guys, the last bar. There's an instrument that dominates the sound, just the last bar, and. What do you reckon? Anyone over here? The piccolo. Now, piccolos are dynamite, okay? We love them to bits, we love piccolos, but there's a time when you could say, don't do that, right? <laughs> and that's one of them, because everybody goes deaf. Everybody goes, oh my God, that piccolo texture. Everybody goes, mmm. The whole orchestra does that. They do. And you can tell by their eyes. But if we go, <laughs> boodly do, then we take the piccolo down an octave. So we do the first one and then we come down. Let's see. Here we go. So this is bar 46. One, two, three, four. <laughs> And that, in my view, that cleans the texture. It allows the sheen to come through on the first violin. You can hear the clarinet solos and the halves really clearly. And all you have to do is stop the piccolo. <laughs> so we mean that in the nicest possible way, Julian. But piccolo writing, if you want to learn about piccolo writing, the most interesting person is Berlioz.